Hi everyone, I hope you're all keeping well. Um, what I thought I would do is read you part of a book and I'm going to keep reading little parts of the book. The book that I've chosen is Code Cracking for Beginners. Um, I thought this was quite an apt book considering it's a VE day on May the 8th. Um, do some research and to find out what VE day is all about. Um, this book, it's set in 1941 when cousins Sam and Lily are evacuated north to a sleepy seaside hamlet, they hope that they'll find safety. Instead, the two children encounter local hostility, a shifty character sending messages in a secretive code, and a treacherous plot. Sounds interesting. Okay, so let's have a look here. So before the story gets started, I wonder if you can work out what we've got here. Um, have a look what all the items are in first um, and see if you can work that out. Yep, you're right, it's a suitcase. In war, um, a lot of the children, particularly if they lived in cities like London, they had to evacuate. So they had to leave their families and go to the countryside and lots of places like in the north. So they had to pack a suitcase. Within that suitcase, of course, they'd have to put clothes. Um, they also had an identity identity card, so you can see the little green booklet in the bottom corner. Um, there's another little book behind it. Um, they've got a picture of mum and dad, or family, or carers. Got some marbles and a yo-yo. And have a look at the other items on the right um, that you can see. Got a bar of soap, toothbrush, scrub and brush, some coins, and it's also got her name tag on there as well. Okay, right, so let's look into the book. So there's some children there looking very worried. I think um, I would be worried as well, leaving the people who looked after you, carers or parents or grandparents, and you can see that they've got a suitcase there, they've got a box around their neck, and they're being evacuated. So this book, it's got 22 chapters. Um, I'm only going to read probably about two chapters uh, in this reading. Chapter 1. Far too young to be a hero. Death was coming. It would fall from the skies like a hail of deadly meteors. Not dropped by some malevolent force from outer space, but spawned from the iron bellies of Hitler's deadly Luftwaffe bombers. Sirens wailed their nightly warning, conducting a drumbeat of frightened feet across the pavements of London's East End. Streams of panicked citizens spewed through the narrow streets. Children screamed their resistance as mothers and fathers hauled them through jostling crowds. Wardens barked orders and pointed instructions at the hordes, but few people paid any attention. They were too fearful of the fire and fury that was roaring over the English Channel towards them. Terror had already turned pretty young faces into ugly balls of fear, and the eyes of thousands were turned constantly upward, pulled wide by the dread. Eleven-year-old Samuel Hunt watched all of this from beside the mouth of Bethnal Green Tube Station. He had long since grown used to the sirens and fright that gripped this sea city most evenings. For him, the piercing howl was oddly reassuring, a sign that life and London were still functioning. What he feared much more was the silence that came afterwards. That was where the Grim Reaper's work could usually be found. Better head down the steps, Sammy, a familiar voice urged him. The heavy-set butcher's wife herded her two toddlers past him. Adolf bombs can't reach you down on the tube. Sam smiled a thank you. I'll be down in a minute, Mrs Griffiths, just as soon as Lily gets here. Don't let that cousin of yours be the death of you, Samuel Hunt. Mrs Griffiths warned as a crowd swept her and her children down into the underground station. You've got to look after yourself in times like these. Sam wasn't listening. He was too preoccupied with scanning the faces that were pouring towards him. He searched anxiously for the ones that belonged to him. Sammy, Sammy. He saw the waving arms before he pinpointed their owner. 
A wave of relief swept goosebumps down his arms as his blue eyes locked onto a pair that were almost identical to his own. The beacon of red hair that bobbed in the sea of hats and scarves could only belong to one person. Mum, over here! Sam waved back, knowing that his own thatch of ginger hair would guide his mother straight to him. He felt the squeeze of pure love as his mother enveloped him in a hug. She planted a warm kiss on his cheek, then landed a sharp slap across the back of his head. How many times have I told you not to wait? Joan Hunt growled at her son. The Germans won't wait until you're safe before they drop those blasted bombs. Dad told me that I'm the man of the house while he's away, Sam reminded his mother. I'm just doing what he would do. Well, he would want you to be safe, Joan snapped. You're only 11, Sammy. That's far too young to be a hero. Sam peered over his mother's shoulder. Although he'd only just turned 11, he was already several inches taller than her. Sometimes he felt like a beanpole. Where are Aunt Peg and Lily? Where we should both be. If they've got any sense, Joan told her son. They're probably keeping us a space clear beside the heating vents. She shivered and pulled the collar of her woolen coat up around her ears. It wasn't yet autumn, but there was already an early chill to the late August evening. But I haven't seen them yet, said Sam searching the crowd for a set of familiar ginger curls. And I've been here since the siren started. It was unusual for his mother not to be accompanied by her sister and young niece. The two families lived on neighbouring streets and usually did everything together. His cousin, Lily, his cousin Lily spent so much time at Sam's house that their relationship felt more like that of a brother and sister. Sam watched a veil of worry slip across his mother's freckled face. She was still a beautiful young woman, but the stresses of war were beginning to draw wrinkles around her eyes and lips. The house was empty when I passed, she told him. I thought they'd be here. Get down those steps, an angry voice barked behind them. Sam didn't need to look over his shoulder to know that it belonged to a warden called Jack. The booming voice and bullying tone was almost as familiar as air raid sirens. A heavy hand shoved Sam's shoulder, spinning him towards the station stairwell. You're blocking the entrance, the warden growled. growled. That's how people get killed. Sam steered his mother towards a huddle of families heading to the safety of the stairs. When she was locked between two waddling, waddling grandmothers, he whispered, I'll meet you by the cigarette machine. What? No. His mother twisted and threw a hand out towards him, but Sam moved too quickly. Her straining fingertips lightly grazed against his shoulder as he dodged back towards the street. Sammy! It'll only take a minute, he assured her, watching the crowd carry his mother towards the underground sanctuary. Then, he added underneath, under his breath, Dad would want me to check. Chapter 2. Dogs Without Owners The streets of Bethnal Greens were deserted. Even the wind seemed to have been chased away by the sirens. Everywhere looked frozen in time, and as he navigated his way across the paved streets, Sam felt like an intruder. He was surprised to see a trio of bewildered dogs cross his path. The fugitive terriers trotted round a corner and paused to stare at him their little dark eyes shining like buttons. Sam hoped that a friendly smile would put them at ease. Beneath their coats of matted fur, they looked half-starved and he felt sorry for them. Once beloved family pets, the dogs no longer had owners or homes and ran a daily gauntlet of danger. They now survived and what scraps of food they could scavenge and, all, and the goodwill of strangers, even though it was an offence to feed them. Despite all this, Sam knew that these dogs were the lucky ones. They were still alive. Since Winston Churchill's government had banned the ownership of pets, hundreds of thousands had simply vanished from the country's secret streets. Sam still remembered shedding a tear when he had read the Home Office pamphlet telling owners what to do with their non-essential animals. Food is rationed now, and the animals would only panic during the air raids, his mother had explained. There's no other way, Sam, 
blame Hitler, not Mr. Churchill. Sam had been glad that they hadn't owned a dog or a cat, but that didn't stop him from now wanting to reach out and comfort the mangy strays. Before he had a chance, the largest of the three gave a yelp and the trio bolted for the nearest alley, probably pursuing the scent of a tasty rat or mouse. Good luck, Sam whispered after them as he broke into a trot himself, heading into the opposite direction. The haze of twilight was beginning to fall across the borough like a shawl. The streetlights no longer functioned, and London would fall into total darkness as soon as the sun dipped below the horizon. If Sam didn't reach the underground before night fell, he'd have to take his chances against the Luftwaffe's merciless cargo as his legs carried him onto the narrow street that he called home. A sound as familiar as that of his own breathing told him that he wasn't the only resident not yet taking shelter in the underground. Lily. His aunt Peg's voice was shrill with panic. Where are you, Lily? Lily! Sam found his mother's sister roaming the next street, frantically pounding on locked and silent doors. Tears of worry and fear had already made her freckled cheeks shiny. Has anyone seen my daughter? Peg yelled desperately as she pressed her face against a glass of darker window. Lily, are you in there? These houses are empty. Sam's voice made his aunt gasp with shock. Everyone is on the tracks. His mother's younger sister rushed towards him, grabbing Sam's shoulders and hugging him. Spirals of red hair tickled his cheeks. He breathed in her familiar scent. She wore the same cheap perfume as his mother. Pe Peg wiped the tears from her eyes and fixed her nephew with what was supposed to be a glare. What are you doing here? Samuel Hunt. Where's your mother? She sent me to get you. He lied. Lily too. Hope briefly softened his aunt's glare. So you know where she is? Without replying, Sam took his aunt's hand and guided her along the pavement. Black shadows were chasing away the last strands of daylight now, but, even in the thickening gloom, Sam navigated their route with ease. He'd always boasted that he could find his secret hiding place blindfolded. This was his chance to prove it.